Hello everyone and welcome back to this channel. To any of you new joiners since I did the booktube newbie tag, welcome! I'm Ingrid and I am your random librarian. So today, because we are talking about this crazy hyped book, I figured I would wear my most aggressively terrestrial dress. So we've got some tigers, we've got some foliage, and we're talking about a world in which those things don't really exist anymore. So let's get into it. Of course today we are talking about After the Flood by Cassandra Montag, a book I have been seeing all over Bookstagram for its beautiful cover. I had to bring out my phone in order to show you this because as much as I love reading on my Kindle, it just doesn't have the same impact. You know, this is like boom, and this is like eh, after the flood. So this has currently got a rating of 3.76 stars based off of 5,884 ratings and 997 reviews on Goodreads. It is described as an inventive and riveting epic saga after the flood signals the arrival of an extraordinary new talent. A little more than a century from now, our world has been utterly transformed. After years of slowly overtaking the continent, rising floodwaters have obliterated America's great coastal cities and then its heartland, leaving nothing but an archipelago of mountaintop colonies surrounded by a deep expanse of open water. Stubbornly independent Myra and her precocious seven-year-old daughter Pearl fish from their small boat, the bird, dry land only to trade for supplies and information in the few remaining outposts of civilization. For seven years, Myra has grieved the loss of her oldest daughter, Ro, Ro I think it's Ro, who was stolen by her father after a monstrous deluge overtook their home in Nebraska. Then, in a violent confrontation with a stranger, Myra suddenly discovers that Ro was last seen in a far-off encampment near the Arctic Circle. Throwing aside her usual caution, Myra and Pearl embark on a perilous voyage into the icy northern seas, hoping against hope that Ro will still be there. On their journey, Myra and Pearl join forces with a larger ship, and Myra finds herself bonding with her fellow Seekers, who hope to build a safe haven together in this dangerous new world. But secrets, lust, and betrayals threaten their dream, and after their fortunes take a shocking and bloody turn, Myra can no longer ignore the question of whether saving Roe is worth endangering Pearl and her fellow travelers. A compulsively readable novel of dark despair and soaring hope, After the Flood is a magnificent action-packed and sometimes frightening odyssey laced with wonder. An affecting and wholly original saga, both redemptive and astonishing. So there are two reviews here I would highly recommend because they both like feature things that I felt on the extremely negative end and on the extremely positive end. So Chelsea Humphrey wrote an awesome review highlighting some kind of key quotes and points. She gave it five stars off the bat um, for its uniqueness within the apocalyptic genre of fiction and com its compulsive page turning, character development, and some like connections that she did based on her experience as a mother and Myra's written experience as a mother. Then we have Kelly and I think her blog is Easy Vegan slash Vegan Damon and she did like a whole book review on it but she gave it two stars and basically said it was really promising but that things didn't really do what she wanted them to. She did DNF at 76% of the book and I'll tell you in a bit like I think most of the action actually happens at like 90% so I understand her her review. Right, so she she broke down the novel thusly. She said it was 40% for her pointless whining about ethical dilemmas. Myra's gonna Myra, am I right? 30% boat talk, 10% cringy sex scenes, and maybe generously 20% intriguing world building and poetic prose about the natural world. So her review is very engaging as well. So if you want kind of, after reading each of them, I feel like I'm pulled more in the direction of that review, whether it's on the higher end of the five-star review or the lower end of the two-star review. So uh, it's a it's a interesting dilemma to be in, but if you need to be swayed one way or the other, those are the ones I would recommend. <laughs> so I would say that this book should come with trigger warnings for violence, gore, and drowning. <laughs> so 
there are these militaries or like paramilitary, paranaval groups that pop up in this post-apocalyptic world because there's so few people and, you know, the nature of power and all that good stuff. And the fight scenes with them, like the sea battles that happen, are so well written. They're very engaging. They're very cool. Um, but they do not hold back. It's a lot of death. And like, even when you're not in the battle, sometimes like just out of nowhere, someone will get like their throat slit or something. You're like, what? So if that is not your cup of tea or if you're going to get like triggered by violence and like realistic depictions of death and gore, then this is not the book for you. Also, the characters are as much afraid of the ocean as they depend on it for food and transportation. So we get like kind of cautionary tales of people drowning and that might make you feel like the air has been sucked out of the room if uh, that is something that freaks you out a little bit. Speaking a smidge from my own experience there, uh, I'm not, I know how to swim and I'm not actually scared of drowning, but like there's this one scene where a girl gets caught in like an underwater, underwater house, because all houses basically are now underwater. And I definitely have a fear of like closed spaces underground, like going through underwater tunnels and things like that, like, ooh, makes me very, very nervous. So that whole moment in the story, I was just like, ugh. Give me, give me some ugh, creepy crawlies. And then honestly, when it comes to kind of like uh, analyzing the book and figuring out if I recommend it or not, I am so conflicted. So there are like, there's definite strengths and weaknesses to this story. I think uh, the strengths are that it is extremely original. I've never, I don't think I've ever read or seen anything that takes this into account, that rising seawaters could just like flood the whole place. Like that takes it obviously to an extreme, but it's very well done and it does feel realistic, which is terrifying. The fight scenes, like I said, are really, really well done. Um, the world building, I think, is pretty strong. You get a sense of where things are. There's a map at the beginning to kind of give you a visual sense of things. Um, the way she describes environmental changes, depending on where they're sailing, and all of that is really well done. When the boat lurches, you feel like you're lurching. I just, on a scene-by-scene -scene basis, and also like understanding the move of things were flooding, people moved inward in the US, things kept flooding, people needed to move to boats, we're now in boat land. Like that kind of, it, it just made sense. And I think she did a good job with that. So the place is like really brutal. It's really brutal. I think it makes sense in a post-apocalyptic thing like this that it, it's pretty, it seems like it's pretty recent because we get Myra who's the main character and we're in her head and she lived through all of the stages. So though it's a hundred years in the future for the reader or its intended audience, it is something that happened pretty quickly once it started happening because Myra lived through all the different stages. She remembers going to school before things closed. Like she knows all of like the old world skills. Whereas Pearl, who is seven apparently, um, I have a point about that later. That's why I'm putting emphasis on that. <laughs> Pearl has just been alive. She was born on a boat. She's lived on a boat her whole life. She's going to stay on boats because I don't think there's any draining happening. And I think the water is not going anywhere. It's definitely that sense of like generational disconnect too, which I think is super well done because not only is there that generational disconnect of like the things that they've experienced and the life experiences and the kind of information that they both have based on their upbringing, there's this like generational, familial, like scars of the parent very much affecting the upbringing of the child, which I think is very... 
real to life for a lot of families just in today's world, so I imagine it would be exacerbated by a post-apocalyptic situation, which I thought was really well done. There's also the fact that Myra is a very unreliable narrator and it's handled really well. We kind of, we get these moments of her being like, oh no, like, what have I done? Both to her child, to the crew that they join a part of, and then we get this like post breakup rewriting of the past and like don't actually get a sense of the reality of Jacob and Myra's relationship until way later in the book when like we get the other side of the story. From the start we only get Myra's point of view which is like, dude I'm pregnant and you just kidnapped our other kid and left. And we get these scenes of them like courting and getting married and we don't actually see any like discord so it feels like a slap in the face that he left to her and she right like obviously blames him but there's more to the story Ugh, it's just it's really well done because I think a lot of people have that where like when a breakup happens if it's unexpected especially it's like everything was fine like what do you mean or well it's all their fault like everything that ever went wrong with our relationship was their fault I was blameless and like I just think it was a good way to handle that. <laughs> then the weaknesses of the book when I was reading it. The romances are kind of weak, but I feel like that about everything. Like it didn't bug me because they weren't the focal point. They were just kind of like things that happened between everything else happening. And I mean, one of the romances was even kind of used in a manipulative fashion in order to have Myra get her way of where they're going <laughs> which i don't love but you know like post-apocalypse do what you gotta do i guess then um we have we have so many flashbacks which always give us very important information but the way they come up is either like oh it was a dream or like it feels like myra is constantly being bowled over by memories and like they're like waves that come in life which just wreck her and she has no control over it or like anything like that and like maybe she has some sort of some form of PTSD or something and that could be explained but reading it I was just like this is not how like memories work like it literally will just like cut in the middle of, there's one where it's in the middle of a fight scene and it cuts from the fight scene and like a conversation that she's having with Pearl to a different time in a different place and a different memory and then like she's all disoriented when she comes back and I'm like Ugh. now that I'm talking about it it's like probably some form of PTSD so I probably shouldn't like harp on that too much but it just felt very unreal and very choppy I guess is the the main complaint I had with it while she was experiencing them so then the ages really bugged me because Pearl really doesn't feel like a seven-year-old to me. She feels like a teenager or like an adult. She... And maybe maybe it's supposed to be like, oh, well, she had to grow up fast because it's the apocalypse, but it just felt very strange to me. And her age, I think, is only really mentioned like maybe once or twice other than in the description of the book. I have no idea what age Myra is either. Like, she could be anywhere from... I guess she can't, I like have to base her age based on her children, but I don't know when she, she was in high school, I guess, when she stopped going to school, but she feels like, she feels like an 18 year old too. She feels like a young adult or like, I guess maybe up like between 18 and like 25 maybe, but I, uh, it feels weird that she has kids. It feels very strange to me that she has children. Like that's the driving force of like all of her narrative and all of her, this story, but I don't know. Like I think I would believe it more if she was searching for a sibling than if she was searching for a daughter because she doesn't feel like she's mature enough to be a mother. And poor Pearl, like Jesus. Um, like she tries to be like, no, I'm not picking between my daughters. And if you were the one kidnapped too, like I would make her do this and we would be going on an adventure to find you. But like, 
oof, there's just a couple times where you really feel for Pearl and she is like, hey mom, like you're not listening to me, like all this stuff and like yells at her a couple times being like, I hate you, like why are you making us do this? And yeah. Then other things that I thought were pretty weak in this book, they saved so much of the action and like the actual wrap up of the story for the last 10% of the book. Like we have not even gotten to the colony yet and it's I looked down I was like how, how how is there only like this much left that makes no sense they just left so many things that needed to be fixed and needed to be like explained that it it felt kind of rushed at the end then there's this like sense of emotional jerkiness during like key scenes where like we're supposed to identify with Myra and she's supposed to have these moments of like talking with the romantic interest or with with um, Pearl and she just goes all over the map and I'm like ah like you can't you can't have it both ways and have her be this like emotionless like driven leader and then have her go from like crying to like comforting someone else, to taking all the blame, to saying it's someone else's fault, like just ugh, so many emotions in so little time and having all of like the emotional weight go to like one person and have them be like, well, you know, I'd do anything for you. Like, I know by the way you're looking at me that you know I would do anything for you. And I was just like, that doesn't fix it. So... <laughs> And then the, I think the main issue I have with this book is the way that it was marketed versus what it actually is. So I was really expecting like this grand adventure of dystopia and pirates and like mad, you know, high seas, all that kind of stuff. But, and, and there was that, there was some of that. I mentioned the, the swashbuckling fights and all that good stuff. But I mainly felt like this was an extended meditation on grief and loss. Like loss of parents at the beginning, life, culture, the past, Myra deals with all of that. And she deals with all of that like to the floods. Like she loses her mom when like floodgates break or something. Her dad commits suicide very early on. Then while they're on a on the boat and like it's post flood time she loses her grandfather i think mainly to age but like it's still a loss and it leaves her and pearl alone in the world so she loses a lot to the floods and then kind of flood adjacently then there's loss of people in violent and non-violent forms along the journey that they're taking loss of trust slash breaking of trust both myra doing the breaking and myra having her trust broken and obviously the kidnapping and loss of her daughter at the very beginning that is like the driving point of this book. And there are like really beautiful moments of kind of diving into loss and what grief and what that means. But it just wasn't what I was expecting from the book at all. So like here, I'll pull up some of the quotes that I had highlighted as a way of trying to explain. The jumbled mess that's going on right now. Right, so this is from one of the women on the boat. Her name is Mara Jim. If I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, I am terribly sorry. I keep thinking grief feels like climbing a staircase while looking down. She said, you won't forget where you've been, but you've got to keep rising. It all gets farther away, but it's all still there. And you've only got one way to go and you don't really want to go on rising, but you've got to. And that tightness in your chest doesn't go away, but you somehow go on breathing that thinner, higher air. It's like you grew a third lung, like you've somehow gotten bigger when you thought you were only broken. And then Myra responds, what Marjan had said sounded nice, and I wanted to believe it, but I feared it couldn't be true. That after too great a loss, I'd simply be snuffed out. That being broken simply meant being broken. So there's a couple of times like that where she's talking about loss and talking about the after effects of it and the different ways that people react. So I thought that was, that was interesting because she wasn't 
trying to say like one size fits all, everyone reacts to loss this way. And all of the different types of griefs, grief are very complex in this book. And it really impacts different characters choices and how they interact with the storyline. So I thought that was, it was interesting, but it wasn't what I was expecting. And then there's of course this huge, there's so many instances of like parenting and whether you're doing it right or wrong. And I think for someone who has children, that would probably be more of an interesting plot point. She, we're in Myra's head, like I've mentioned, and she tends to just kind of like make decisions and think about Pearl afterwards, which is very frustrating since Pearl is the best part of the story. And I think just like the emotions get really complicated and Pearl gets kind of lost in the shuffle, even though Myra claims that she's like the driving force of ever I don't know. I wanted to tell her that it wasn't that I loved Ro more, but that I had other darker things in me that turned my decisions, my rage and my fear. They got all mixed up with my love and I couldn't separate them. And I have highlighted like four different times where Pearl is talking to her mom saying like, you don't listen to me, you never listen to me. And, oh, this was also really interesting. <laughs> Rediscovering the things that I thought were cool. Um, based on like the generational differences. She said, I hid from her as my mother hid from me and what was she hiding from me? Talking about Pearl again. So there is that kind of awareness, but it doesn't affect the decisions as much as I feel like it should because Pearl is the last remaining like link that she has to family. It just, like even when it's just the two of them on the boat, it feels like she doesn't take Pearl's thoughts that much into consideration like she's constantly think or not she's it's not mentioned but it feels like she's constantly thinking like oh well I'm the mom she's the child she doesn't get a say despite the fact that like she, she knows what's best for herself and like knows what she's afraid of and knows what she wants to be protected from like uh, there's just a weird disconnect oh there's this whole thing about like hope that Marjan, again, she's the one with the wisdom, okay. She talks, she's talking to um, Myra saying, you don't need fish in the sea, you don't need dry land so much as you need hope. You're strangling yourself. Which I disagreed with at the time because um, she's been hoping this whole time and been believing this whole time that Roe is still safe, still alive, still thriving in this community that she's never visited, that it's gonna take them like months to get to. She has to still have hope that she's going to be there still. Whether it's in physical like, oh, she wasn't taken away by another boat or like emotional, like, you know, a lot of people seem to have been really messed up by this and by, they talk about like breeding ships and like slavery and like all kinds of horrible things that come back because we're seeing the worst of humanity and um like even even um biological warfare like different things like that it's like she has to have so much hope to believe that this child or teenager however old she's supposed to be is still there like what do you mean she's strangling herself without hope like <laughs> That just seemed very strange to me, but I think that I think there are several points where you can kind of feel that the author has a message or like has a good line that she's like, ooh, I'm gonna throw this in there. And yeah. they are pretty lines though. So after a couple of chapters, Myra has very clearly integrated this into her worldview because she comes up with this uh, little pithy thing which says, Hope would never come knocking on your door. You had to claw your way toward it, rip it out of the cracks of your loss where it poked out like some weed and cling to it. But even in trying to have this like, this message kind of woven in and woven in at the end specifically to be like, no, it's okay. Like even in the apocalypse, like hope can make everything better. Even when like half of the characters we started out with at the beginning of this storyline are now dead and murdered and floating in the ocean somewhere. It's fine because there's hope. Like it, 
I don't know what kind of book it would be if this message wasn't tried to, to like, sneak in there because I think that would be even worse of like, <laughs> you get to the end and there's nothing and no one matters and everyone's dead and like, cool, like, what do we do now? Like, I think there needs to be this kind of message, but it also feels like it was too little too late that maybe we should have acknowledged that she had been clinging to hope this whole time about her child and not tried to been, be like, no, I, I have been smothering myself and now I understand that I deserve hope. Like, it just felt strange. So I think those are all the quotes that I wanted to highlight. I have some others that I highlighted, but like, I don't really know how I wanted to work them into my review. <laughs> so, all in all, I think I would root recommend it to people as long as you know what the book is going in because it is really unique and there are these moments of like really beautiful writing but it's not this kind of post-apocalyptic adventure it's a post-apocalyptic rumination on the human condition how people react to horrible situations, the good, the bad, and the ugly kind of thing. And I just feel like it was falsely hyped. I think it deserves hype. I think it is a really interesting idea and I, it's hard to be unique and write something completely fresh, especially in a genre that has like blown up in popularity since the Hunger Games came out, but mm, yeah, just once you know what the book is and you're not kind of waiting for an entirely different plot, I think it is much more enjoyable. So that is my two cents. <laughs> I know that this book is crazy hyped at this point. And I would love to know your thoughts on this if you've read it or, or why you're avoiding reading it if you haven't. So if you want to leave me a line down in the comments below, I want to keep this conversation going. I think it was a, it brought up so many like thoughts that I don't really know how to articulate just yet. And I would like your help with that. So <laughs> if you've read it, please let me know your thoughts down below. Um, and hopefully we can work this out together. I think those are all of the thoughts I know how to put into words right now about Cassandra Montag's Into the Flood. If you liked this review, which I hope you did, uh, please consider hitting the subscribe button down below or coming and finding me on Bookstagram at Random Librarians. I hope I will see you guys in my next video and until then, happy reading! <laughs>